On the night of Saturday, April 24, 1915, the Armenians in the capital were snoring in a calm sleep, exhausted from their Easter celebrations there on the heights of Stambul near Hagia Sophia, while in the central police station a secret project was in motion. Blood-colored buses were already transporting groups of Armenians who had just been arrested from the near and far suburbs and the neighborhoods to the central prison. Chief of Police Petri had sent official letters weeks earlier in sealed boxes to all the guard offices with orders to open them on the same day and to carry out the assignments with precision and in secret. The letters contained the blacklist of the Armenians to be arrested. It was a death-smelling night. The sea was rough and our hearts were full of terror. We were under strict supervision of the police and we weren't allowed to speak to each other and we had no idea where we were going. We ended up in the central prison and here behind gigantic fences and iron bolted gates, they put us in a wooden shack in the prison circle which was sometimes said to have served as a school. Under the flickering light of a lantern on wooden floors, we sat quiet and stunned and confused. We were barely sinking into our own fear and despair when the iron doors of the prison creaked open again and a multitude of faces were pushed inside. They were all familiar, all of them either political reform leaders, public servants, and partisan and nonpartisan intellectuals. From the silent night out there, every few hours until morning, newly arrested Armenians were brought to prison. Behind the fences of the prison, there was a strange hustle and bustle of the growing crowd of prisoners. Like some dream, it seemed as if on one night, all the prominent Armenians of the capital, assemblymen, representatives, progressive thinkers, reporters, teachers, doctors, pharmacists, dentists, merchants, and bankers had made an appointment in those dim cells of the prison. More than a few people were still wearing their pajamas, robes, and slippers, and it made the whole scene seem even more dreamlike. Right through till morning, the newly arrested Armenians appeared, and each time we heard the roar of the military cars, we hurried to the windows to see who was coming next. When the new ones arrived, they had contemptuous smiles on their face, but as soon as they saw the hundreds of Armenians before them, they too sank into fear. All of us kept searching for answers. All of us kept asking, what's happening? This is really a historic occasion in that for the first time in public, uh, the knowledge that 82 writers mass murdered in the Armenian Genocide has come to the foreground. Uh, and it represents a kind of unique commemoration, one that is both solemn and really uh, triumphant, in some way affirmative. Uh, and to have such a group of distinguished writers coming together uh, to pay respect and homage to this silenced generation of Armenian writers uh, is, uh, is a first. So uh, great to be here and great to see such a full house. I wondered why we were walking with a few packages of rags in our hands. The two of us, drifting from one dead village to another. Then we met an old humped woman who approached us with a bag of bread and a walking stick. Since morning, I've been searching for the ashes of my house. Eight days ago, Turkish neighbors ruined our village. My eldest son died in a fight, I'm told. I performed his last bath in a stream. Our old neighbors, now our enemies, took pity on me because of my age. And like friends, because there were no friends, they came and buried him a day later in the orange grove. Now my eyes are dry and I can't even cry for my dead grandson. For eight days I've gone from tent to tent. No sleep, no waking hours, only dreams. Let them ruin my world, but spare my grandson, I screamed 
kill me in my grandson's place, kill me. But no one heard. No one heard, and they threw the half-dead boy in the cart of corpses that passed from the convent. I still see his eyes. For a long time they were open, staring at me as he gave up the ghost. I still hear the cart creaking. She sobbed and went on. No home, no family, I'm alone with my own death. You should have seen my house. What a hearth of good things, lambs, hens, a white cock. Everything in my sheepfold burnt down. In my granary, I had a handful of wheat for autumn. Under my garret, two beehives. In one day, the whole village was burned. Every morning, smoke puffed out my chimney. What did the Turks want from me? Tell me. Look over there, the remains of my cottage. Look at the spring spilling into the brook under the ruined wall. It waters my ashes. But what does any of this mean without my grandson? Give me two stones so that I can crack my head open. They've even cut down my mulberry tree. Give me death. They've cut down my mulberry tree. I planted it the day my grandson was born. They've cut my mulberry tree. Woe to his memory. It grew tall before my eyes, just like him. It was seven years old, and I was sitting in its shade with my grandson in my arms singing. They've even cut my mulberry tree. Look, they sawed it at the roots. Where is the cart with the corpses? I still hear it squeak. I want to be thrown into it next to my grandson. There's still a place on the cart. It was a horrible sight, the miserable woman clinging to a sawed off branch of a mulberry tree falling down. I couldn't hold back my sobs. And on that road to hell, the young woman I was traveling with began to cry like a child. And finally, one day, Exhausted by the road, we stopped to rest at the threshold of the dead city. We looked into musty, misted streets of the dead city where terror glided, flew into our faces, and into our fever-struck, devil-struck hearts. Nothing breathed in the dead city. The windows of the deserted buildings started, stared darkly like eyes without pupils. No sockets without eyes, and we dared not return that stare. I don't know why we entered a house. The wide holes of the windows gaped like sunless, dug-out eyes. At the threshold, a cat's body, who would have killed it. We entered and saw the broken bed, a woman fallen drenched in blood, naked, the blood-stained mouth holding a laugh, open like a hole, smelling of fear, her hips, the dry bloodied breasts told us, rape. The lid of my skull disappeared then, as if my brain were not mine, and sky and ground danced together. Someone said, let's get out of here. But where could we go so that those naked hips and those breasts could not find me? We stayed there that night in the ruined houses of the dead city. Terrifying visions crowded us, jumping, dancing, like crippled, maimed bodies in a feverish, circling dance of the dead. In one of the houses of the dead city, my eyes propped open in the candleless dark. I lay terrified and sleepless. Before me, the dead bayed, groaning, moaning around their fires, their dead bodies with blue legs, yellow breasts, swollen and blood-spattered buttocks danced, staggering before my terror-filled eyes in the grave pit dark. They sang, moaned almost as if in joy, mixed with weeping, 
in cold and horrible hollow tones that gnawed at my hearing and in my agitated brain, their song seemed to be transformed into a sad knowledge that I too did not exist, that I was part of some hot distant dream in which my soul was being borne away with no will to resist. The water is dark with clay and lime, bitter depilatory lime, and here and there, knots of brown hair float, curls from armpits, snarls from bushes, brushes. Meanwhile, the owners sink exhausted, filling their rinsing bowls for the last time, emptying them for the last rinse, filling tubs for the last dip, filling the bath with noise again. And the bubbling water flows and the beauties swim. Their skin catches fire like the petals of the burning rose as they pour water over the fire, their eyes languid as one arm pours the water and one arm supports their breasts. Now they hurry out one by one, flame by flame, breathlessly, ripened into blooming by the steam like red tulips. Oh, those damp curls that reach bare chests. Oh, those soaked curls that shed pearly dews. How can I describe the sweet smell, the aura, the radiance, when tarled dry, you dress like goddesses? I want to kiss your fingers, which you dip deep into the wooden henna bowl now, as if into a red, bloody heart. I want to kiss your hair that is anointed with incense and will spread scent tonight on your pillows. I want to kiss those cloud-like eyelashes, those painted brows, and to kiss throat, clavicle, chest with the golden necklaces which become a bright chandelier of light when the chains reach the breast, a chandelier over a marriage bed. Let me kiss to the navel where you keep the hashish of Arabia and the musk of Africa. Laden with jewels, you walk home and the pavement becomes freshened where you step. Let the cool air nip your chin, pinch your cheeks. From the damp towel, from your floating skirt, let the fragrance of time arise, perfuming the street and the square. And the leftover food you carry home in a cup, covered with a towel, let it too release exotic spice so the street of the oriental city will know that May, that spring, with sweet, damp blossoms is walking by. The central government now announced its intention of gathering the two million or more Armenians living in the several sections of the empire and transporting them to this desolate and inhospitable region, the Syrian desert. The real purpose of the deportation was robbery and destruction. It really represented a new method of massacre. When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving the death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and in their conversations with me, they made no particular attempt to conceal the fact. All through the spring and summer of 1915, the deportations took place. Scarcely a single Armenian, whatever his education or wealth, or whatever the social class to which he belonged, was exempted from the order. And a little later on, in the same chapter, Ambassador Morgenthau writes, after having described much, I have by no means told the most terrible details for a complete narration of the sadistic orgies of which these Armenian men and women were the victims can never be printed in an American publication. Whatever crimes the most perverted instincts of the human mind can devise, and whatever refinements of persecution and injustice the most debased imagination can conceive became the daily misfortune of this devoted people. 
I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. If a miracle should take my road to the Euphrates of my childhood days, I could find our small ancestral house just by breathing, even both eyes closed. From the blue flecked light that plays on its gilded waters flow, I would recognize the brook growing, going through my childhood days. I could pass a thousand poplars and find the single slender tree that rustled upward skyward, wearing heaven with its leaves. I would inhale the winds of daybreak to find the smoke that rose, the aroma of our oven, of bread baking that was ours. If a miracle should take me to my childhood there, I could find our house by breathing, eyes closed, breathing in our air. As we've said, a whole generation of writers was killed at the onset of the genocide. And not only was their writing stopped and destroyed, but the Armenian readership also was destroyed. It was not for another generation that literature could begin. This morning, I am shaken, no, seized by a strange but irresistible need, a longing to hear my mother tongue. And I go in search for another Armenian, any Armenian, so we can speak together. Can you understand the strange want and ache? I want to find another high, any Armenian, even one who has forgotten his language and history. Just let him remember one word and let us find each other so I can say, hi, yes, are you Armenian? And if he nods yes, I will shout, Buddy Luis! Oh, in the name of everything holy, I swear nothing sounds so sweet or tragic than that good morning in a foreign place. Oh, language dark as night, fresh as daybreak, consoling and wise enough for prayer. Oh, Armenian, let me hear your syllables this morning, please. Thank there are boys living past 40, 50, 60 and longer, as long as man lives, but staying boys. No, they are in that terrible place belonging to neither man nor boy, but where they both live, together, waiting with unfulfilled hunger for the invitation to eat, waiting but knowing all the time there will be no call to dinner. It is impossible they wait, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying, sometimes running like fugitives into the past. You know, God, you have no gift for them except your pity. Allow at least the angel of death to kiss them fiercely passionately. Small, miniaturized, yet you insist on shaking your canyons and cliffs with huge spasms as if you were the center of the earth and the magnet that draws out and fills every sea. So small, a corner, not even a corner, scattered points, dispersed and dispersing lines of fallen walls, walls you imagine the palace you once raised from this mantle of dust. How can you dream of old architecture today when every edifice caves in to make way for new shapes? Any shock can erase you forever and no eye will even blink, yours alone the concern but hope rises like the sun. Accumulate, dust consolidates into stone. At least a handful of earth, 
for these slain bodies, for these whitened bones, a handful of earth at least for these unclaimed dead. We bury the dead. We keep their memory sacred. The grave is holy to us. We place our dear ones in its bosom and we imagine them always to be there. But here they are in the mountains, unburied and forlorn, attacked by worms and scorpions, the eyes bare, the faces horrible, amid a loathsome stench like the odor of the slaughterhouse. There are our women with breasts uncovered and limbs bare, a handful of earth to shield their honor. There are our boys naked and torn with bullets in their hearts and in their heads, a handful of earth to cover them. There are our brides disemboweled, hacked to pieces with babies as yet unborn, a handful of earth only to screen our eyes from their sorrowful scene. A handful of earth, God, spring a handful of earth so that thine eyes through the stars may not see the immolation of these weak and defenseless creatures, the piteous sacrifice on the altar of thy wrath. Throw a handful of earth upon them. What we say as scholars and writers about genocide matters a great deal. When writers deny genocide in the face of decisive evidence that it has taken place, they contribute to a false consciousness that itself has malignant repercussions. Their message is, their message is murderers did not really murder, victims were not really killed, Mass murder requires no confrontation, no reflection, but should be ignored, glossed over. In that way, they encourage, indeed invite, a repetition of the crime. They invite a repetition of the crime. They contribute to the deadly dynamic in which unopposed genocide begets new genocides. We do better to bear witness to historical truths to the full narrative of mass murder and human suffering, to take a stand against cruelty and killing, whatever their source and whomever their victims. Among the distinguished guests in the audience tonight is a former director of the New York Public Library, Mr. Vartan Gregorian, known to all of us in this room. Um, all our distinguished guests who have transcended nationality, religion, race, in order to witness for truth, for justice, but more important, for memory. And that's why today's important event is not just about Armenians. It's about all writers, all creative people, who daily put their pen, their lives at stake for truth, conscience, but more or less memory. By witnessing for Armenians, they're witnessing for everyone all over the world. <laughs>